Magic, do as you will. The Last Unicorn. This has been on my list to do for a while. I wasn't sure when I was going to get around to it, but I feel inspired because, if you weren't aware, Peter S. Beagle, writer of the original novel and actually the screenwriter for this animated version, has been touring the film around. And I actually got to see it on the big screen, which I've never gotten to see, and hear him talk about the writing of it, the adaptation of it. If you're like me, you grew up on this movie, Find out if it's coming anywhere near you and if there's stops left and get tickets. Also inspired by that experience, I have now actually read the book, which I did not do. I grew up in this movie, but I never read the book. And I have now read the book and it's wonderful and amazing. And also another thing I'm gonna recommend for anyone who likes the movie. But I gotta set those things aside and really just talk about this film on its own merits as best as I can, having now had these experiences. The Last Unicorn tells the story of the last unicorn in the world, who sets out to try and find out what happened to the rest of her kind. And along the way, she picks up some interesting companions, has some adventures. And the film has certain elements of a road trip movie. It has, it has tons of elements of fairy tale, which is ultimately what it is. Now, this film dates back to the early 80s and was done by Rankin Bass. Now, at the time that they did this, they had already done their adaptation of The Hobbit, and it's very much in that same visual vein. And visually, this movie is gorgeous. The, the sophistication of the animation is not as high as you would get from something like Disney. They didn't have the time or the money to afford quite that high quality of animation, but the quality of the designs and the artwork is just stellar. A lot of the animators who worked on this would later go on to form Studio Ghibli with Hayao Miyazaki and work on many of his films. And you can see that same level of commitment and integrity in the art, art and the design. Seriously, you can freeze frame almost any random second from this film and it's just a gorgeous image even though the smoothness of the animation itself is not the highest quality in the world. The voice cast is really stellar in this film as well. There's Mia Farrow playing the unicorn and she has a, a bit of a tricky job because the unicorn is sort of ethereal, a little bit detached, but she still is able to bring just enough sort of warmth to her voice and to her performance that you feel for her and you care about her because she could have come off, frankly, kind of bitchy in the hands of an actress who, who didn't get the character. Another really big highlight, though, has got to be Schmendrick the Magician, who's voiced by Alan Arkin, and he is just wonderful. Alan Arkin has this wonderful sort of low-key delivery that just really suits a magician who is bad at his job, and that is exactly what Schmendrick is. He has high ambitions, he wants the world, but he's just, he's not very good, and he knows that. There's some other great voices in here as well. Angela Lansbury really going against type as the witch mommy Fortuna. She's, oh, she's creepy. And then there is the incomparable Christopher Lee as King Haggard. Now, his voice casting, I think, was really key and quite essential because King Haggard actually has a pretty interesting and detailed kind of backstory and history to him, but the film doesn't have time for that. I mean, this, this was done as a children's film, and it's got a pretty tight runtime, but his voice and the way he delivers lines and just sort of the weight of what he has to say and the way he says it says a whole lot about the character that the film didn't have time to set aside and say, okay, here's what he's about. And in many ways, Alan Arkin brings the same thing to Schmendrick, where he's able to give you a whole lot of information about this character and about this character's history, just the way that he says stuff. I also want to single out a character who I especially now appreciate uh, more as an adult, which is the character of Molly Grew. She's voiced by an actress by the name of Tammy Grimes, and she is She's a character who really is in there for the for the adults because she's past her prime and her reaction when she first sees the unicorn is anger because you know, the legend is that unicorns are supposed to come to young, beautiful, pure maidens and she's not that. She hasn't been for a while and she is so angry that the unicorn would dare come to her when she is old and past her prime and it, it kids may not quite get but I, as an adult now it's a really powerful moment and then the character is just delightful anyways there's also the music now the music is honestly a little bit of a mixed bag the songs that are good are great the main title song the last unicorn is a stellar song and it's perfect for this movie then there's another song also early on called man's road which is also just great for setting the tone of what's going on and and sort of getting you into the mood for everything that's going to happen unfortunately the songs aren't quite as good in the latter half 
just in general, but also for another reason, which is that some characters start actually singing, and that hasn't happened up to that point. First half of the movie, first two thirds really, the songs just play in the background and they sort of serve to overcut almost kind of montage type things. And then when the characters start bursting out into song, it, it comes out of nowhere and unfortunately the actors who sing, I don't want to say that they've got bad voices, but it's very clear they were cast for the quality of their acting, not the quality of their singing voices. Which sort of leads me into the what is the main weakness of this film, which is that its first half is much stronger and much more interesting than its second half is. Now, having now read the book, I can confirm what I had long suspected, which is that the second half works very well on the page, because basically what happens is that the characters sort of get to where they said they were going to go a little bit past the halfway mark, and then the story goes into basically a lengthy delay stalling the climax. Now, it works in the book because we're given some really heavy insight into these characters and, and getting really down to the meat and bones of what it is that's going on with them. Here, it's more surface level, and surface level, it reads kind of corny, kind of cheesy. Thankfully, it does not completely fall apart. The latter half is carried by, I, I mentioned already, Christopher Lee, but there's also some really stellar stuff with a cat, and a skull, which are just wonderful moments that help liven things back up again for a pretty strong finish at the very end. I will say that don't be shocked if younger kids sort of fade out on the latter half of the film. And also, I suppose it's worth mentioning that if you're particularly sensitive about what your kids see, this was made back in the early 80s where the standard of GPG was not exactly the same as it is now. So there are a few, I guess, which you would consider scary moments and there is some use of the word damn. But for my part, I think the strengths are strong enough that it carries through and glosses over the weaknesses. It's not a perfect film, but I think it's a film that was done with a lot of love. It's a wonderful story. It's very well cast. And as I said, even though the actual quality of the animation movement is not the highest, the, the images are stark and they stay with you and they're just they're beautiful. So that's my take on it. Have you ever seen The Last Unicorn? If you did, what were your thoughts on the thing? Did you love it? Did you hate it? Whatever it is you thought, drop something down in the comments and let's talk about it. As for me, I'll be back as soon as I can get my next fix.